Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to the first 2023 webinar of the European Society of Mycobacteriology. I am Daniela Cirillo, the president of the society, and I am happy to introduce our speaker for the webinar of today. Our today's speaker is Dr. Claudio Cosu, is not new uh, uh, to any one of you, I'm pretty sure, but he is a visiting scientist at the Department of Genetics, University of Cambridge. His main interest lies in, bring, in uh, bringing modern microbiological principle to defining susceptibility and resistance to anti-TB drugs. This work, revealed that the WHO breakpoints for several first and second line drugs had been too high, resulting in the systematic misclassification of resistance strains as susceptible. He is working closely with UCAST and drug developers to avoid these shortcomings from new agents. Uh, very few housekeeping notes for the webinar of today. The webinar is supported by Beckton and Dickinson. Beckton and Dickinson doesn't have anything to, to, to say with the content of the webinar. This is an absolutely independent webinar. It's just a supporting this kind of action to the society. You can send your question during the talk using the live chat window. I will make sure that your uh, questions will be answered. In case we don't have time, uh, Dr. Claudio Cosa will reply to you by email. To use the live chat, you'll need to sign in to YouTube with either a YouTube or a Google account and then join the channel. Live chat messages are not private. Everyone who tunes can read them. Include your affiliation in your, in your question. And in case we are running short, please include your email. The chair will ask the speaker audience questions after the talk. The sooner you ask your questions, the more likely uh, Claudio will have time to answer to it. If you are not able to ask the question via live chat, you can also email the questions to the office at esmmycobacteriology.eu. And uh, again, Claudio, without losing more time, the floor is yours. And thank you for being available to provide us uh, your time in this presentation. Claudio, the floor is yours. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. I'll turn on my camera at the end when I, I discuss your questions uh, with uh, Daniela. Um, so I'd like to start by saying that the views expressed here are my own. Um, I should also point out that I work as a consultant for BD, which involves a collaboration with Janssen and um, Thermo Fisher. Uh, but um, I will provide, I think, a balanced um, view on MIC testing in general, as you'll see throughout the uh, presentation. So the overarching questions that I'd like to tackle as part of this um, presentations are what MIC testing is, how it's carried out, what the implications of MIC testing are for the way in which we define susceptibility and resistance, and to really towards the end to try to answer the question whether routine uh, phenotypic antimicrobial susceptibility testing should be uh, is best carried out with by MIC testing or whether testing only the breakpoint as is mostly done in the TB field to date is um, sufficient. In addition, I hope to really provide you some with some food for thought and um, to this end I would just like to start by pointing out a couple of relevant uh, papers or reports for you um, uh, uh, to read if you want to learn more about um, this topic. Um, on this uh, slide, uh, there's a uh, 
editorial down here that summarizes, gives a good overview of the current state of um, AST in the TB field. Um, the, these two WHO reports provide a good overview of the quality of MIC evidence that have been used to revise breakpoints um, recently. And then uh, here on the right is a recently published WHO report which provides some guidance as to how commercial um, MIC plates uh, could be improved. And then if you're more interested in learning more about uh, the um, details of MIC testing, in particular the impact of technical various biological uh, um, uh, variability on the impact of MICs, uh, I can really, um, I can recommend the work done by John Turnage and Gunnar Karlmeter, but also um, Erik Böttger. And in particular, there's a uh, paper at the top, top about facts and fables about uh, MIC-based dose adjust, uh, adjustment, and I'll pick on, up on some of those points throughout my presentation. So, just to highlight, basic in the TB field, we use typically talk about drug susceptibility testing, whereas in the rest of microbiology, we typically say um, AST. I'll might switch between the two, but I'll try to use AST just to be more consistent with what it's uh, used in other fields to try to reduce the TB specific lingo. And I think the first point that's worth reminding everybody about is. AST is, is carried out in vitro, and we all know that tuberculosis causes uh, disease in different states. So what we measure in vitro is not necessarily representative of what's happening within a patient, but we hope that it is of some predictive value, because if it weren't, there would be no point in carrying out um, AST in vitro. It's also worth just pointing out that for a lot of pathogens, we don't actually carry out uh, MIC testing routine, routinely, but actually rely on the disk diffusion methods, whereby you have a lawn of bacteria, and then you have disks on that um, plate, and then the antibiotic diffuses out, and then you get zones of clearance, and then you measure the diameter of that zone of clearance, which it gives you a, um, and then which, is a different way of measuring quantitative um, effects of antibiotics. Now, unlike the disk diffusion method, MIC testing uses a series of defined concentration that gives you a non-continuous result. And by international convention, one should test two-fold dilution series that are based on one milligrams per liter. So for example, 0 0.5, 1, 2, four and eight. But it's worth pointing out that often in the TB field, that is not actually, this convention isn't followed. So it's actually important for you to, whenever you read a paper, to read the method section in detail in order to be able to interpret what an MIC actually means. So I just want to highlight this with a, here with a hypothetical example. So in study A, the concentrations which are shown in gray are tested. So in other words, in study A, they tested 0.5, 1, 2, 4, and 8 milligrams per liter. So in other words, there was one isolate that wasn't inhibited at 0.5 milligrams per liter. In other words, that MIC could be 0.5 or smaller than 0.5. And again, a lot of TB studies don't represent this MIC um, correctly if essentially the MIC is truncated at the lower end. In other words, we don't know what the actual MIC endpoint is. And then we can have the opposite effect on the other end of the scale. So in other words, we had two strains in study A that grew even at eight milligrams per liter. And in this case, the MIC must be greater than eight milligrams per liter, but we don't know precisely where. Now, just to make the point to drive home that you need to be careful about what an MIC of, for example, two milligram per liter means. So in study B, only 0.5, two and um, eight were tested. 
So an MIC of two in study B is not equivalent to an MIC of eight because essentially these three results that should ordinarily be an MIC of one will come up as an MIC of two in the study. And you need to be very careful about that when you read um, studies. Now, it's also worth reminding you that numerous factors um, affect the MIC. In other words, there's no such thing as a true MIC. So for example, the composition of the medium can um, affect the MIC. A good example would be the pH of perazinamide affects the MIC. If alanine is present in a medium, that would affect the MIC of cycloserine. Whether or not one uses CO2 can affect the MIC because the CO2 alters the pH of the medium and the pH can either make uh, a lower pH can either make a drug more or less um, active. And I think this is one of the points where a lack of standardization in the TB field is um, problematic because laboratories in the US traditionally use CO2 uh, incubators for 7H10, 7H11, but also um, LJ, whereas a lot of labs uh, in Europe don't. And therefore, this is one source where the technical variability might be larger than it um, should be. The incubation temperature can affect the MIC. The incubation period crucially can affect the MIC. And I'll come back to this particular point later in my uh, presentation. Crucially, the inoculum can also affect the MIC. And um, there are some drugs that are more affected than others, and that's what's known as the inoculum effect. But even if you take a step back, there's a good reason as to why the inoculum is important. So we all know that um, there is a, each drug has its own mutation frequency. In other words, if you were to take an inoculum that's larger than the mutation frequency for a particular drug, then any sample that you test would be would um, come out as being resistant. And last but not least, the way that the endpoint is defined can affect the MIC. So for some assays, you read at full inhibition. In other cases, you compare to a 1% growth control. And for some drugs, you might um, discard pinpoint growth. It really depends on the drug that we look at. And in this context, it's also worth remembering that typically when we do MIST or distribution testing for an E. coli or Eclipsiella, for example, one typically starts from one or two single colonies from a plate. In other words, there's very little chance that there will be heteroresistance when we do um, AST. By contrast, for tuberculosis, we might start off from a positive hemorrhagic culture, or we might actually take a sweep of colonies from a primary um, plate. In other words, the, there is a much higher chance that the um, culture is mixed. And this is why I think one of the crucial recommendations for MIC testing for improvements of commercial plates is the inclusion of 1% growth control to ensure that we don't read a plate too early um, because we it's important to give enough time for minority variants to show growth. Now, I did say that there's no such thing as a true MIC, but this doesn't mean that MIC testing um, it becomes a free-for-all. Instead, it's important to standardize the method that's used for MIC testing to minimize the technical variability. Now, as you will see throughout this presentation, that's an important theme that I'll um, come back to time and time again, is that the technical variability cannot be fully eliminated but it is important that it is minimized. And it's important to measure the quality of testing using a quality control strain when a method is developed, because that allows you to test whether different tweaks to your method either increase or decrease the technical variability. And once a quality control target and range is set, you can then use the QC strain 
monitor the performance of testing during the clinical trials or during routine AST. So, and the QC range is really a mixture of the intra and in laboratory reproducibility. You shouldn't have any biological um, variability here because you use the same um, strain, at least assuming that you didn't subculture it for so long that your QC strain um, acquired uh, changes that affect the MIC. The QC range is typically three to five doubling dilutions wide. And I think that's worth bearing in mind because this technical variability is larger than the technical variability that you typically get from most PKPD measurements. And the QC range should usually encompass 95% of your uh, this, uh, QC distribution. And crucially, UCAS also sets a QC target, which corresponds to the mode of the distribution. And CLSI doesn't set QC um, targets, but I hope I'll illustrate why a QC target is particularly helpful. Now, let me, so this particular diagram shows a hypothetical distribution of a QC strain, and this would be measured in a multi-center study to capture both the intra and inter laboratory reproducibility, and then the QC range would be set in such a way as to capture 95% of that distribution. And then the QC target corresponds to the mode. So really one of the key points that I'd like you to take away from my presentation today is that you really shouldn't think about what the MIC of a particular strain is, but rather what the MIC distribution is um, for a strain. Now, let me give you some let me proceed from a hypothetical to now a concrete example. So these are MGIT MICs done for Bretonamid, and you can find these in Bateson et al. that was published um, last year. And these are data from six different uh, laboratories. And you can see here the number of replicates, overall replicates for H37RV. So this is the same strain tested in uh, multiple labs. So you can see that there is some variability from lab to lab. So for example, lab three has, has somewhat lower MICs than laboratory two. And there's also obviously some variability uh, within each laboratory because even within the same lab um, doesn't always yield the same MIC. So if we were to set a hypothetical QC range, and I'd like to stress that this hasn't been endorsed or reviewed, I'm just using this really for illustrative purposes, would probably uh, cover these four doubling dilutions. And then the QC target would probably be these two dilutions um, in the middle. Now, and let's just for the sake of argument, assume that 0 0.5 is also the hypothetical breakpoint for Pretonomit. Again, this is purely for illustrative um, purposes. So one point that I would like to emphasize is that there are quite a few studies uh, in the TB field that suggest that if you get a supposedly low MIC below the breakpoint, which in this hypothetical example would be 0.5, that one can potentially lower um, the dose that you're using for treatment. But I hope that this emphasizes that this really isn't a, a good idea because we have the same strain here that gives quite a bit of technical variability. And simply because in one lab, it might happen to yield an MIC of 0 0.06, doesn't mean that you can decrease uh, the dose uh, of uh, protonimate. Now, this doesn't mean to say that there are no hypersusceptible strains, and, uh, and I'll get back to those. Some of those do exist, but it's very difficult to be sure about whether a strain is truly hypersusceptible based on a single MIC result in light of the tech inherent technical variability of testing. 
Now, the next point I just want to make is really to illustrate how both the QC range and the QC target is used to assess potential problems. So as I said earlier, the data up here are for um, results from six different um, laboratories. And I've just uh, added another set of um, results, and these are completely hypothetical for laboratory seven. So if you were to look at these replicates of H37RV, you can see that um, nine out of the 10 replicates uh, fall into this QC range, which suggests that testing is not too bad. But actually, if you focus on the QC range, you can see that clearly the MAC distribution shifted towards higher MACs. So there's a systematic error in testing in uh, laboratory um, seven. And that's why just assessing whether something um, whether your uh, replicates for your QC strain fall into your QC range is a little bit misleading. This is why I think the target is really important because testing within a laboratory, you, one should really aim for the target, which is not the case here. So it might be that they left the antibiotic out and it started to degrade, which is why you have shift towards higher MICs, but it might be that there's some sort of other explanation for the shift towards higher MICs. Now, let me just compare and contrast this with another hypothetical example. So these are replicates for H37RV from laboratory eight, and you can see that the distribution looks similar, but what you can see is that 90% of the results actually fall into the QC target, and so and only a single result falls outside the QC range. So in this particular case, this is likely a, just a random one-off result, assuming that this doesn't become, uh, isn't reproducible. So it might be that the first nine results of testing were these ones here, and they all fall into the target, but the last result is the one up here, and then it might be that the 11th and 12th results then also end up being higher. So this initial random error might turn out to be the start of a systematic problem. So I hope that this, these hypothetical examples illustrates that how a QC, having an on-scale QC result, give you a much better sense of what might be going wrong within your laboratory. Are we dealing with a systematic error or is it largely random? Or, and, just to give you an example, there are some laboratories that carry this out routinely and stratify QC results also by operator and then have coded into the laboratory information system to automatically yield results for abnormal results for a particular operator if there's, um, and so this just gives you an example of how you can use these results. Now, I just want to point out one of the limitations of the current sensor data plate, because if you, if you go to the website, it actually um, claims that one of the strengths are on scale QC results. But actually, if you look into the insert, the QC ranges for the majority of the drugs are truncated. And as a result, you can't actually use this um, uh, carry out QC comprehensively despite the claims. The other point, uh, that I want to um, highlight is that any breakpoint that divides a distribution will result in poor categorical um, agreement. So up here, these are candida, individual candida results, MICs, and then what's neat about this experiment is that one of the isolates that originally yielded an MIC of two um, uh, micrograms per milliliter was retested, 51 times and results are shown here. So if you were to set a breakpoint that divides this distribution, you would have poor categorical agreement. In other words, you would flip flop between the susceptible and resistant results simply because of the technical variability. And that's really what the ECOF, which uh, tries to capture, that's the pre-existing bio typical biological variability 
And this is considered when clinical breakpoints are set that define isolated is either susceptible, susceptible to increased exposure or resistance. Now, typically when you measure MICs to a new agent, you typically find something resembling a normal distribution that's shown here in blue. And there is some biological variability um, in here, but a lot of it is actually uh, technical variability. And then the ECOF corresponds to the 99th percentile of the distribution. This is really then considered when setting the brain code because you don't want to divide this wild type distribution. Otherwise, you might end up with poor um, uh, reproducibility in testing. And so, our then breakpoint set. So again, this is a hypothetical example for MICs. We have our wild type distribution here, then mechanism one, two, and three that result in higher MICs. And then you look at clinical outcome data and PKP data to decide which of these distributions are treatable. Now, it might be that your clinical trial fails and it shows that even phenotypically wild type strains are untreatable, in which case the breakpoint would be below and you'd consider the entire species to be intrinsically resistant. It might be that you need to have a higher exposure even for phenotypically wild type strains to be treatable. But in the vast majority of cases, a trial will give you confidence that you can treat phenotypically wild type strains, in which case the echo would become the clinical breakpoint. And only if you have sufficient clinical evidence to demonstrate that high MSEs are treatable, could you then raise the breakpoint. But often it's very difficult to get sufficient clinical um, evidence, particularly given that justifying a clinical trial in which you enroll patients um, with elevated MICs might be an unethical um, uh, enterprise. And then it might be that you can increase the exposure to overcome resistance by mechanism one, but there's nothing you can do with mechanism two or three. And then we have one last example, which is very rare indeed. Now let's return to our example of protonimate. So up here again, I have the QC range, which is for H37RV and H37RV is a lineage four strain. And at the bottom, I've just shown the MICs for lineage two, three, four, and a couple of lineage seven results. You, so you can see that these distributions are very similar to the distribution for lineage four. Lineage two might be ever slightly higher, but um, there doesn't appear to be an obvious difference. And one would have to also then stratify more in more detail, because as you can see, some labs, even for H37, have somewhat higher or lower MICs. But when we analyzed these results, the overall judgment was that these are equivalent MICs. So essentially we assumed that these correspond to one distribution. And then the 99th percentile for this distribution corresponds to 0.5 um, milligrams per liter. Now, if one were to use the 99th percentile for group B as a breakpoint, that would uh, not be a good way to distinguish group B strains from lineage one strains, which can have intrinsically elevated MICs to um, protonomid, because essentially at 0.5, you have a lot of overlap between these group B strains and lineage one strains. In other words, a strain, a, lineage, a group B strain that happens to have an MIC of 0.5 is not equivalent to a lineage one strain with an MIC of 0.5. So if one wanted to set a breakpoint at 0.5 because one deemed lineage one not to be treatable, and again, this is purely hypothetical, I'm just trying to make the point, one would have to set what UCAS calls an area of technical uncertainty at 0.5, because if you get an MIC of 0.5, you can't be sure whether it's group B and therefore susceptible, 
or whether it's a lineage one strain and therefore um, resistant. However, recently UCAST has actually set what it's called a screen value at the upper end of lineage two and it for MJIT and therefore effectively deemed lineage one and group B strains to be treatable. So the overlap in distribution is no longer a problem in this particular scenario. Um, so far, unfortunately, UCAS hasn't provided a rationale as to why it set this, the screen value at the upper end of lineage one, therefore deeming lineage one um, treatable. And I think that would be a valuable, um, it would be nice to see that justification, especially given that the breakpoint in the package insert by the European Medicines Agency is, the, is one. So in other words, two agencies, European agency that um, are, have reached two different and contradictory uh, decisions. And I think it would be helpful if this discordance were resolved and a clear rationale for setting the breakpoint uh, were um, provided. Now, another area where overlaps between distributions is a, is a problem are revampicin. So you all know that there are some RPOB mutations that confer very large MIC increases, which are called your high level resistance mutations. And for those, the technical variability in testing doesn't matter because the absolute increase in MIC is so high that you get reproducible results. But then we have the so-called borderline resistance mutation, which confer more modest MIC increases. And in other and the problem there is that the lower end of those borderline resistance mutation, what Eric Butker's group um, referred to as the resistance cutoff, which corresponds to the lower end of the distribution, is lower than the current critical concentration of 0.5. In other words, there's a relatively high chance of misclassification of these borderline mutations simply because of the inherent technical variability in testing. Now, this can be minimized by setting an area of technical uncertainty to some extent, but it's also worth saying that there are some borderline mutations that overlap to an even greater extent with a susceptible distribution, and therefore even an ATU can't fully solve that particular problem. But here, WHO helpfully has set some clear rules whereby if a predefines, if these predefined borderline resistance mutations are found by um, genotypic uh, testing, and provided that you made sure that the testing is done as properly, that the detection of these mutations should overrule a susceptible um, result simply because of simply because essentially phenotypic testing isn't a reliable confirmed retest because of the overlap in distributions. Now, the other point that I said I would cut back to is the incubation period. And I think the study by Torea et al. is really interesting because they essentially measured the MICs and MJIT for wild type strains in H37RV and then they included a high level resistance mutation, which is one of the mutations in red in my diagram, which here is shown in um, dark brown. And then they also included the MICs of some of these borderline resistance mutations. And I don't have time to go through this in detail, but essentially what they show is that if you extend the incubation period beyond the standard cutoff that MGIT imposes, the overlap. So first of all, the MICs, all MICs increase, they shift towards higher MICs, but the MICs for borderline resistance strains increase to a greater degree. In other words, the degree of overlap between the susceptible distribution and borderline resistance strains decreases over time, which just illustrates that degree of, that the degree of overlap is dependent on how you measure as opposed to being an objective measure of um, these mutations. 
The other point worth making is that the, the, that one can minimize the need of ATUs by selecting the optimal agent for uh, phenotypic testing. And in the WHO report, which I um, pointed out um, in the further reading segment, for which you can find the link at the bottom of the slide, WHO looked and compared and contrasted levofloxacin and moxifloxacin result and found that there's a, there's a greater degree of overlap between the susceptible distribution and resistance strains if you test moxifloxacin compared with levofloxacin. And this is largely driven by the fact that lineage three strains appear to have lower MICs than the remaining lineages with mox, moxifloxacin than if you test levofloxacin. And therefore, they actually recommended that levofloxacin should be used as a surrogate drug for testing moxifloxacin. And one could um, set as an, a surrogate clinical breakpoint to stratify low and high level resistance mutation. Now WHO has made this recommendation for the plate, but it still recommends for other media to test the actual drug that you use for testing. So in other words, if you test, use MOXIE to still test moxifloxacin, even though the equivalent phenomenon is also seen for current media. So I think this is something that WHO ought to revisit and to make, um, because in my view, levofloxin is actually the better surrogate to test even for uh, MJIT or other media. And then a similar phenomenon can actually be seen for calamycin and amikacin. Testing calamycin is a better surrogate for amikacin resistance, and in particular to, uh, to pick up the C-14 mutations. Now, I just want to, before I get to the end, I just want to cover bedaquilin testing, which in my view is the most problematic drug for susceptibility testing, which is a problem because it now is de facto the backbone drug for testing rivampicin resistant um, TB. Now, most mutations in the target, uh, namely ATPE of bedaquilin, are easy to test because they confer large MIC increases. The problem is that these are rare. And the dominant resistance me mechanism is RV078. The problem is that loss of function mutation RV678 confer resistance, and therefore there is a large spectrum of resistance mutations. On top of that, a lot of resistance is selected, so we have a lot of heteroresistance and low frequency mutations. And we have different kinds of mutations. There are some mutations in RV678 which are neutral, in other words, have no effect. There are some mutations, probably like the Eswatini mutation, that don't fully abolish RV678 and therefore lead to intermediate overexpression of the corresponding pump. And then we can have full loss of function mutants, in other words, where the regulator is fully dead and therefore you get maximum overexpression. And I think what's probably happening is that if we look at MGIT results, and again, these are sort of idealized results. We have our susceptible distribution, which are critical concentration at one milligram per liter. Most ATPE mutations will lead to large increases and we, therefore we don't have a problem with technical variability. But I think that even strains that have mutations where the regulator isn't functional at all, and therefore we get maximum overexpression. We probably have the lower end of the distribution is still divided by the critical concentration. And then we have probably like the Eswatini mutation behaves like these borderline resistance mutations that are clearly elevated, but uh, where are there, we have a lot of overlap with the susceptible distribution. And then we will clearly have some mutation that have no effect. In other words, if you were to test their MIC distributions, it would mirror that of the overall susceptible distribution. The other point that has emerged more recently is that, um, and again, sort of the borderline resistance mutation can be somewhat dealt with 
with an ATU. But again, it's it's not a fail safe um, uh, solution, especially for these borderline resistance mutations. Now the other point that has emerged more recently is that there are some strains that are genuinely hypersusceptible to pedoquilin. Um, there are some that are sort of borderline hypersusceptible due to a mutation in the upstream region of RV678. But then you can also have some that are hyper hypersusceptible to uh, pedoquilin because they have loss of function mutation in the efflux pump. And we don't actually know how susceptible these are because there are very few endpoints end, end for those. And the, the crucial point is that if you get a mutation that, would, that abolishes the function of the regulator, which you would ordinarily predict to confer an MIC distribution like the mutation here in red, if that mutation coincides with a loss of function mutation in the pump, then the mutation in the pump fully abolishes that um, effect of that uh, regulator mutation. In other words, if you have an assay that only looks at the regulator, you might you would predict that strain to be resistant when, as a matter of fact, it's hyper susceptible. And this hypersusceptible phenotype is rare globally, but it can be frequent uh, locally. A good example is Peru-Lima, where there is an MDR clone that has a loss of function mutation in the regulator, but also in the pump. And as a result, is hyper susceptible. So I think for drug like pedoculins, we might at the, have to test the critical concentration and the concentration um, below, particularly given that the prevalence of resistance is low in, in many settings to help with the interpretation of genotypic results. And MIC testing is really highly desirable. So let me just wrap, wrap up by saying that I hope that I've convinced you that in principle, MIC testing is the best way to distinguish between systematic random and cutoff errors um, for routine phenotypic antimicrobial susceptibility testing. MIC testing using a standardized method is essential for clinical trials and to set sound breakpoints. And in fact, any commercial method now has to be calibrated against the UCAS reference method so that we have a common standard against which we um, can compare. But I think we also need to recognize that in practice, current commercial MIC plates with lawfulized drugs are not optimally designed and WHO has made some recommendations as to how to improve them. If one were to use an in-house method where you prepare your own plate and also dilute the drugs, et cetera, that's a labor intensive uh, exercise and is potentially also more prone to errors unless this is performed under highly controlled uh, conditions. And if you were to do MIC testing using MJIT, that is a good way to bankrupt uh, your laboratory um, because M uh, MJIT tubes are expensive. So I, th I think what's important is that we minimize the need in practice for MIC testing by first of all, using near patient genotypic antimicrobial susceptibility methods appropriately by providing clear guidance how to interpret those results that take into account the into various factors, including the positive predictive value. I think the introduction of targeting generation sequencing assets will be important not only to rapidly rule in resistance to other drugs, but also to spot upfront systematic errors in particular with targeted uh, genotypic assets such as gene expert. I think when we do carry out categorical phenotypic antimicrobial receptivity testing, we really ought to test the optimal drug. So in my view, it would be levofloxacin instead of moxifloxacin. I think we do need to endorse errors of technical uncertainties where this is relevant 
whereby we test the breakpoint and at least one concentration uh, below the breakpoint. This might be needed for pedaquilin. And then also provide clear guidance how to deal with discordant results between different methods, particular bidarquilin. Because I think for bidarquilin, discordant results might end up being the norm as opposed to the exceptions. And it's important to emphasize to clinicians that these discordances are due to the inherent technical variability, uh, technical limitations as opposed to a lab um, have not functioning properly because we want to avoid the loss of faith of clinicians in the quality of testing. Now, I'm not saying that some labs uh, don't have problems with their quality, but what I'm trying to emphasize is that there are some problems that you can't overcome even in, uh, in high quality laboratories. I do think that we need to invest in the development and comprehensive validation of commercial MIC assays. Because especially if I think for bedarkland resistance mutation, we will likely want to test uh, multiple replicates of particular mutations to get a shape of the uh, MIC distribution and the isolates which this might be relevant might be prioritized by target next gen sequencing. I think MIC testing is also needed for um, surveillance. But also I think MIC testings are important because we want to have more competition in the field. Um, and not just to reduce the cost, but also to reduce the impact of supply problems that are inherent when you have a, a dominant uh, provider for AST. And I think especially uh, COVID has highlighted just how dependent we are on monopoly providers and what the consequences are when supply chains are disrupted. So we want to have alternatives and ideally an MIC assays, if not multiple MIC assays, are therefore highly um, desirable. So at this point, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I will hand over to uh, Daniela to talk about this slide and then we can proceed with the Q&A. Thank you very much, Claudio. That was an excellent presentation. And um, well, let me, before we move to the question, remind you that we will have the next educational webinar on the TB day, March 24th. And uh, please join all who are available, who can, can join the ESM 43rd annual conference that this year will be in Tirana. We just open the registration and the call for the abstract. It's an excellent meeting, it's an excellent forum for young people. And I really suggest that to uh, all of you to join the group. Uh, said so, let's move with the question for Claudio. So far, I only have, Claudio, can you turn on yeah. your video as well? I uh, will. Yes. And um, we do have a, a question from Leopold. And the question is on a MIC, higher MIC for ancient lineages. You have shown the effect on lineage one. And that the question is on other ancient lineages and typically our lineage five and lineage six. Could you comment on that? Yes. So um, lineage five and six are actually have actually got lower MICs than um, group B. So then a group uh, then lineage two, three, and uh, four. So they appear to be lower. Um, and that so the pattern in susceptibility is really odd because it doesn't follow the obvious relatedness if you look at a phylogenetic um, uh, tree. So, and it's not understood what the genetic basis for either higher MICs or intrinsically lower MICs is. Um, M. Canetti also has higher um, MICs, and we don't know why, but obviously that is exceptionally. Um, 
rare. So it's something relatively, so the finding from the Bates study were unexpected because there is some obviously biological, pre-existing biological variability for other drugs, but for some reason for protonomate, this is much more marked than what we've seen before. And it's not understood what the basis is. Um, but it's also worth pointing out that so far there is no indication that lineage one strains have a higher rate of failure than the uh, other M. tuberculosis lineages. But it's also worth saying that there's much less evidence to that effect. So our statistical power is, uh, is very small to make the argument because essentially the clinical trials were carried out in countries that don't have a lot of lineage one strains. And I think this is just a cautionary, cautionary tale to underline that early on in clinical development, one has to test phylogenetically diverse collections to see whether there is pre-existing resistance. And if there is to then choose clinical trial tr sites appropriately to then sample the different distributions um, uh, properly. So it's, 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 an, it's an open question. And I know the WHO are reviewing the evidence to decide where to set um, the, uh, the breakpoint. Yeah. But it's also worth saying that there are some strains that have exceptionally high MIZs, and those are due to mutations within the six activating targets. So there can also be some of those, even at baseline, without exposure to either protonomate or bedalaminic. And those have evolved repeatedly throughout the phylogenetic tree. So we have frequent differences in the uh, susceptibility uh, and deeply rooted ones, but then we also have others that confer higher increases. Thank you, Claudio. That was very clear. And uh, on this matter, the WHO is going to receive additional data, as far as I know, and they will try to increase the, stati the statistical power of the study to really come up with a definitive answer to, to this question. We do have another question, and this is from Christian. And the question is, uh, there is this argument that conventional MIC testing is more accurate compared to the use of midget for MIC testing. Do you agree with this? And what would be your argument on this? So I'm not entirely sure what conventional MIC testing would be. I, I guess I guess it would be 7H10 I or 11. I think it's going to be the plate. Okay, so the plates. I mean, both micro dilution. Let's put okay, it as a both okay. micro so, dilution here. So, so far, nobody has done a head to head study whereby one is compared one with the other. So, these studies are ongoing because commercial assays do have to be calibrated against the reference methods. So in other words, you would test the same set of isolates in both methods. So what's already clear is that for some drugs, there are systematic differences between the methods. So for bedacna, for example, the MICs in MJIT are systematically higher than they are in the reference method. That doesn't mean that MJIT um, is not accurate. I mean, the, the, the key point is, is the difference fully systematic? In other words, can you have a reference method MIC and multiply it by a factor with the MJIT MIC heart? So I think we will have to see the, what these studies um, really um, yield, because what's clear is that broth micro elution testing this UCAS reference method is very labor intensive. So it's really not what we'd want to use on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So we will need to see what the head-to-head -head studies um, show us. Um, because even if you look back at the evidence that WHO reviewed to set breakpoint or it's for MJIT in the past, but even the conventional methods, the MICs were limited, often highly truncated, QC strains weren't included. So we don't really know actually what the technical reproducibility, true technical reproducibility is for any of the methods, and even for the broth microdilution method, we're only just starting to use it. So it remains to be seen. Mm 
Okay, thanks. We do have uh, another question from Leopold. Most of the MIC data you presented is based on the lab MTB strain H37RB, that is a lineage four. How do your results translate for clinical strains for bedaquilin? Um, so, I mean, the MHCs I showed you for the QC range, yes, so there were H37RV, but then I also showed you clinical isolates from different lineages for um, the tournament, where there is, where H37RV isn't representative, clearly, of what's going on in lineage one, as we said earlier. For bedaquiline, yes, for, uh, that's sorry, that's for protonimate. So for bedaquiline, again, we will uh, have to see. So what H37RV isn't representative of the global diversity because, for example, there are some strain lineage one strains that are probably so two to three percent of lineage one strains are hyper susceptible to bedaquiline because they have an inactive pump. Uh, and these appear to be relatively frequent in Vietnam. I also mentioned the Peruvian cluster that again is hyper susceptible. And there are other strains that have loss of function mutations uh, within the pump and are therefore hyper susceptible. But globally, these are relatively rare. Whether there is more lineage variation, I think remains to be seen. And again, Janssen is currently working on, an, on a study to try to address that where they're testing phylogenetically diverse pan susceptible strains against bedaquiline um, to see whether there, there are other more subtle differences. So again, it remains um, to be seen because when WHO set the breakpoint for MGIT originally, we had very little, little lineage information for the results that we um, looked at. So at the moment, there doesn't seem to be an obvious marked difference, such as in uh, Protonimate, with the exception of the relatively rare hypersusceptible strains, would be uh, my answer at this point. But again, that more data are needed. We do have the last question from Dan. Uh, um, what about moxifloxacin and GRA mutations other than D94G? Could we use moxifloxacin for treatment if A90V is found? Do you um, have I mean, that is the, for the answer? Yeah, I mean, that is the official W. So any MIC increase is an ex would be an exclusion from the, uh, so for the BPAL-M regimen, you can't, you would drop the, the moxy from the regimen. You also can't use other shorter regimen with any other, with any uh, resistance irrespective of the level, but an individualized longer regimen is an option if you only have a low level resistance mutation. So you can look at the guidance um, to that um, uh, effect. Um, so that's the official WHO um, position. Yes. Then at this point, we are close to the hour. And um, if you have additional questions, you are more than welcome to email the questions to the office of the ESM. Again, the email address is watson at esmmycobacteriology.eu. We, I'm sure Claudio will be more than happy to reply to you by email. If he doesn't do, I will try to do contacting Claudio. And, um, you know, and I hope to see you, all of you back first on the 24th of March for the next BD sponsored webinar. Again, BD is an independent sponsor, and we thank BD as a, as a huge supporter of the society. And uh, I really hope you can uh, start considering your, um, you know, you start, you can put the ESM meeting on your calendar and you start considering to join us in Tirana. With that, I thank Claudio again. I thank Watson for the usual fantastic support.
Claudio, you were very clear, always a fantastic webinar. It's a pleasure to listen to you. And uh, thank you to all for your uh, first time with us for one hour. Good afternoon, good morning. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.